The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... prayer reads, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord, deliver us. 20th century man, of course, knows there are no such things as ghosts. There is one problem. He's never been able to prove it to everyone's satisfaction. Our mystery drama, the Captain of the Pole Star was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Paul Hecht. If I say Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, what leaps to your mind? Quickly. Of course, Sherlock Holmes. Everyone's aware that Doyle wrote stories in which Holmes did not appear, but unfortunately, they were engulfed by the tidal wave of Holmes' popularity. It's a pity, because Doyle was a great storyteller and a master in creating suspense and terror. Today, we'll let you judge for yourself with this strange and tragic tale as reported in the diary of young Dr. John McAllister Ray, whom we now hear applying for a position as ship's doctor in the office of Ronald Bruce, who operates a fleet of whaling ships. Uh, sit down, Dr. Ray. I can't abide young fellows who stand at attention. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, that's better. Now, you've applied for the position of ship's doctor. You think a whaling voyage is something like a holiday you young medics get on the P&O ships to the Far East? <laughs> All fancy dress and beautiful, lonely young women. Uh, now, excuse me, sir, but I don't think that's quite fair. Uh, if you've read my application, you'll see that I'm interested in research on... Uh, the effect of extreme cold on human conditions. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't realize you'd read it. <laughs> Don't apologize. I like young men with spunk. Can't be a good doctor unless you've got some courage. And you'll need a lot up where these whalers go. <laughs> Yes, you're not married, but uh, are you attached? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I am engaged. Hmm. And what does she think of her being away for a matter of some long month? Well, I didn't see any point in telling her, sir, until the job became an actuality. Mm, it's cautious, too. <laughs> I like that. I suppose I'd better get right down to it. Uh, we do have an opening for a doctor on the Pole Star. Oh, you do? Yes. The fact of the matter is, we don't know yet who is going to skip her the Pole Star. Well, it would appear to be more a matter of concern to you than to me. As well as on the service, uh, for the last four years, the captain of the Pole Star has been David Craigie. And we've been very satisfied with him. He's a fine sailor and always brings home a full ship. Well, I don't understand the problems. Well, Craig here hasn't appeared. Well, you could surely get in touch with him and uh, ask... You, you don't understand. Craigie on the ship is one thing. This is as short as something else. He has uh, peculiarities. Uh, one of them being that as soon as he's finished a voyage, he gets his pay and takes off for parts unknown. <laughs> we don't know where he is. I see. Uh, well, I'm giving Craigie until tomorrow. I still am of the opinion Captain Craigie will be here. And I, I must warn you about Craigie's peculiarities if uh, you should sail with him. Peculiarities? Yes, yes, yes. It would be on my conscience if I neglected to explain that although Craigie is our best captain and a fine man, is subject to moods, fits of depression. Well, I don't know the medical terms, but I must tell you he has them. He's also a very private man. In fact, his cabin is off limits to all members of the crew. Uh, he keeps it locked throughout the voyage. Not even the steward is allowed him to clean up. The, the captain does for himself. I see. Now, <clears throat> if this sort of behavior might give you problems, I, uh, I wouldn't want you to sign on. Well, I've always respected privacy, sir. Ah, fine, fine. Uh, on your way out, my secretary will give you some papers to sign, and we'll expect you aboard the Pole Star on the 19th at 8 a.m. sharp. <laughs> You have 
haven't eaten a thing. Why did I have to fall in love with such an insensitive man? Now, that's an unreasonable statement. Is it? Here we have our first dinner. I mean, the first dinner I cook for you. And I'm all happy and excited, and so are you. But not about the dinner, no. You're happy because you're going away and leave me for four months. Well, I'm sorry, but I thought you understood. I don't have the money to open my own practice. With the money I'll be able to save from my pay on the Pole Star and with the bonus that's practically assured if Captain Craigie shows up. John, we've been engaged for only five weeks. And you're actually happy about the idea of being separated for four months. Well, I'm not happy about the separation, but... Well, I am looking to the future for us. I... I, I just don't want you to leave me. Darling, this isn't like you. We've discussed the problem that comes with being a doctor's wife and all the separations it might entail, and now all of a sudden... I know, but call it woman's silliness or whatever you like. There's something about this voyage that frightens me. Something I feel, something bad. Laura, darling, believe me, if you could tell me one thing, one solid fact that has brought this feeling on you, I won't go. I love you, Flora. But you do see the logic in what I'm saying. That's why I'm so unhappy. Because I have no logic. Only intuition. And John, I'm afraid. Terribly afraid. <laughs> As I open my diary for yet another entry, I cannot help but remember Flora's forebodings. As I write the date, September the 11th, I realize we've been out some three months now. Latitude 81 degrees 40 minutes north, 2 degrees east. There is solid unbroken ice to the north to which we're anchored. And the same conditions prevail to the east and the west. Uh, come in. I'm sorry to bother you, Doctor. Uh, that's all right, Mr. Walker. We're running into real problems with the crew. Oh, uh, medical problems? Uh, no, sir. Uh, the men are all healthy. It's the captain in the ship. You see, if that pack ice in the south hardens, and <laughs> we're going to run out of food and fuel, uh, the men want the captain to turn around and head for home. Well, you're the first mate. I should think that you'd be the man to pass that information along. Well, ordinarily I would, sir, but uh, well, you know the captain. He seems to have taken a liking to you, so the men decided I should ask you to convey their wishes to him. Uh, will you do it, sir? Well, if it's their wish, but I feel that such a request coming from me... The man who's on his first voyage to the Arctic may not exist. Oh, you don't have to be an old hand up here, sir, to know that from now on the weather can only get worse. And that the ice of the south will freeze solid. Uh, we must get away while we can. Oh, very well, Mr. Walker. I'll speak with the captain today. Denoting in my diary that the northwest corner of Spitsbergen was visible on the starboard quarter, I went up on deck and found the captain leaning against the rail, staring over the ice to the north. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, good morning, Captain. Finished with your diary for the day? Uh, not quite, sir. I'll have to record the results of this conversation with you. Do you write down all our conversations? Yeah, no, no, sir, but... Uh, this is different than our usual small talk. Could it have anything to do with the visit of Mr. Walker to your cabin earlier? Ah, you don't miss much, do you, Captain? A good skipper runs a tight ship. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I may be out of line here, sir, but I promised Mr. Walker I'd speak to you, so uh, here goes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the men are, are unhappy about staying here. They... They want to go home. Oh, do they? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They, they feel that to stay here longer is endangering their lives because it's only a short time before the ice to the south seals us in. I'm aware of that possibility, Doctor. Ah, then you... Uh... There are whales to the north, Doctor. A whole school of them. I've seen them blowing. Do you realize there's only one small strip of ice to the north between us and a fortune? Well, money won't be much good to us if we're dead, Captain. I like you, lad, but nothing's going to stop me from getting them whales. From your answer, I take it that there's considerable danger in our staying, and there's justification for the men's feelings. Danger? There's danger on every trip to the Arctic. 
Your research should have taught you that. As for the men, they're paid to risk their lives and will pay too, so... And your life, Captain? What about that? My life's my own, Doctor. But I'll tell you one thing. There's more to bind me to the other world than to this other world. Your meaning escapes me, Captain. You stick to your medicine, Doctor. I'm going below. Tell Mr. Walker to call me if there's any change in the ice to the north. Now get out of my way. I informed the first mate of the captain's decision, wrote it up in my diary, and turned in early. But I slept badly that night. Between fits of wakefulness, I dreamed. And they were strange dreams, or rather the same dream. I dreamed I heard voices from the captain's cabin two doors away from mine. I could only make out snatches of what I thought I heard. Nay, Ross. Nay. Why? Why do you keep me? the nightmare was so vivid, I could still hear the sobs of the woman and the voice of the captain. I began to wonder, was it a nightmare? No. I dismissed the thought until breakfast. Captain, may I have permission to take a foraging party out on the ice at noon? No, Mr. Walker, you may not. Uh, but we might be able to pick up some polar bear meat or other animals, and, and that would And be... you might also lose a man or two in the ice holes. I feel the wind's going to shift, and we'll be able to break through to the north and get to the whales. Uh, uh, sir, the men are restless, and any kind of activity... Then would... put them to work on the brass, Mr. Walker. Well, it isn't only that, Captain. It's... Well, mister? It's, uh... Well, it, it's... Uh, nothing, sir. I, I guess it's just superstitious sailors who claim to hear strange cries and mewlings at night. Uh, you have your orders, Mr. Walker. I'm going topside and look for that wind ship. Doctor. Yes, Mr. Walker. Uh, do does the captain... Well, I mean, in your opinion, is he... Uh, well, is the captain in full possession of his senses? Now, that's a sobering thought. In a world today where dictatorship is fashionable, no one has ever questioned the absolute authority of a captain when his ship's at sea. However, suppose this man who controls the destiny of his ship and crew is mad. That problem is one that will be faced in our second act. takes many forms in literature as well as life. People may argue that in Moby Dick, Captain Ahab's frenzied pursuit of the legendary white whale was a form of insanity. But there, at least, the crew and everyone concerned knew exactly what drove Captain Ahab. The question facing ship's Dr. John Ray on his first whaling voyage was not only is Captain Craigie sane, but what form did the dark demons that were driving him take? Because there was no question that the captain of the Pole Star was a driven man. Uh, what is your opinion of the captain's state of mind, Doctor? Well, I'm not prepared to make any professional diagnosis, Mr. Walker. But it's obvious that there's something on his mind. Well, I'm just wondering whether it's the same thing that's on a lot of the men's minds. You mean about getting trapped on the ice here? Uh, no, no, no. About the sobbing and the crying and wailing that goes on in the night. Uh, have you not heard it, Doctor? Uh, no. Well, I have. And so have most of the men. I heard it ever since we left Dundee. 
Almost like it was following us. And screeching. And begging to be taken aboard. You think these noises have something to do with the captain's state of mind? Well, it is likely. I mean, he's human just like the rest of us. Uh, have you spoken with him about this matter? Uh, no, Mr. Walker, because I think there's a perfectly natural explanation for the sounds you describe. The creaking of a ship, the sloshing of water in the scuppers, the rubbing of the hull against the ice, any one of those would explain... Uh, Doctor, Doctor, now I've followed the sea all my life. This is your first voyage. I'm a hard-headed man, and I tell you, no ship ever made the noises I heard. Then what do you think they are? I, 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 I don't care to say. All right, then I'll say it for you. You evidently feel that these noises are ghosts or, or something from the spirit world or, or caused by some other supernatural force. <laughs> After the first mate had left and gone about his business, I recalled my nightmare. For the first time, I wondered whether I had dreamed what I had heard, or whether I indeed had heard the same sounds that Walker and other crew members were talking about. I decided there wasn't much to be gained by speculation, so I went up on deck. Doctor. Doctor, come here a moment. Ah, Captain. Look, yonder. Northward, over the ice. You see it, don't you? Uh, what? Over there. Just now coming out between the hammocks. You must see it. Uh, I'm very sorry, Captain. Uh, uh, there's nothing there. Blast you for a blind idiot. Use your eyes. There. Moving off now to the west. There. Oh, no, easy, easy now, Captain. My goodness, you're shaking. You're not yourself. Uh, look at the perspiration streaming down your face. Let me take you below. Look, man. You see her now, don't you? There, right there. Flying from me, by God. Flying from me. God. God. Oh, easy, easy, Captain. Let me help you below. Here, Captain. Take another swallow. <sighs> Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, you had quite a shock. Now, I think you should go to your cabin and lie down for a while. You... You saw her, didn't you, Doctor? I'm sorry, Captain. I saw nothing. Nothing? You don't think I'm mad, do you, Doctor? Tell me now, man to man. Well, I, I, I think... I think, Captain, you're disturbed about something. Right. But, Doctor... What do your medical texts say about madness? In what context? What do they say about symptoms? Bad dreams? Are they a sign of madness? Well, not always. They can be. Any other symptoms? Let me hear some of them. Well, hearing voices is significant. And other symptoms? Severe headaches. Ah, Nearly a headache since we left Dundee. Yeah, and before that? No head pains, Doctor. Any other symptoms you know of? And delusions. What's a delusion? Seeing things that aren't there. Ah. Now we come to a doctor, don't we? Uh, who the blazes is that? Uh, Mr. Walker, Captain. Well, come in, then. What's the commotion, mister? Uh, it's the cook, sir. Uh, he needs the doctor. Well, what happened? Well, he burned himself pretty badly. Well, let me get my bag. We'll get right down there. I treated the cook's hand, which was scalded, but not as badly as I feared. The captain, with a fine mixture of persuasion and authority, got the cook back into the galley, and we returned to my cabin to let me rid myself of my bag. Captain... If something is worrying you, and you've admitted as much, I can't help you unless you tell me just what it is that's bothering you. Easily said for you. But if I were to tell you what I've never told a living soul, it would do neither of us any good. Well, it certainly can't if you won't tell me. Hey, what's bothering me is between me and... Uh, well, it will pass. But seeing me all these weeks, and just now with Cookie, 
Would you say a court of law would find me mad? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but in my opinion, no. Well, that's that then. But as a physician, and from my observations, I would advise that it would be best for you to get home and settle down for a bit of a rest. Home? One word for me and two for you. You'll settle down with your pretty wee Flora, whereas Open! I... Open! The wind! She shifted. There's a crack in the ice to the north, and we might just be able to get through if you'll come topside and take a look. Shortly after the captain went up on deck, I felt the ship shudder and start to move slowly through the ice. I had some work to do on some specimens, so I stayed in my cabin. The movement of the ship northwards was unfortunately short-lived. After no more than ten minutes, the Pole Star came to a grinding halt. I went up on deck to find both captain and crew vastly disgruntled. But that was nothing compared to what occurred during the night. Doctor. Doctor, open up. It's Mr. Uh, Walker. Uh, 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 it's three o'clock in the morning. What is it, man? Come up on deck and, and you tell me, Doctor. Well, wait till I get some clothes on. I'll be right up. Oh, for the love of heaven, make it quick. Right. I'm afraid to stand watch alone. <laughs> Mr. Walker, what's this all about? Shh. What? What? Quiet, man. Listen, and you'll hear it. I don't hear anything. It came from the bow, a caning and the sobbing of a little child. And then it changed as I went forward to look. I swear it came aboard and... It went down, down below. I was afraid, but I followed it. Oh, the doctor, I tell you, it went right into the captain's cabin. And then it stopped. And that's when I walk you. And since then? I've been listening. Hmm. Have you... Have you ever heard of self-hypnosis? I know what I heard. And whatever it was, it's down with the captain now. He's quiet in it. That's it. Now, you want to come with me to the captain's cabin and ask him about it? Certainly not. The captain has enough on his mind without me barging in at this hour. Well, then I agree with you, Doctor. There's something on his mind, all right. And I tell you, it has to do with his ship. There's a curse on it. Yes, well, I'm going to get Mr. Manson. Are you coming with me? As close as I can. Looking back now, I realize I should have insisted that Walker be put in sick bay, But I simply didn't foresee what was going to happen. I hadn't been back in my cabin a half hour before Manson got me up to help with Walker. When we reached the deck, I could see the figure of Walker lying crumpled on the ice just off the starboard bow. I asked Manson what had happened. We, we were standing at the rail. He was listening. I too, and suddenly he shouted, There! Manson, the lights! Right there off the bow! Do you see them? But I, I see something. I don't think they're lights. Of course they are. And watch! You see the way they dance? Like they're beckoning. Come on, man! Let's find out what this is and put a stop to it once and for all. He went. Mr. Walker, easy, went up those aren't lights at all. Just a reflection of the ice of the northern lights. I can see it plainly now. Don't be a fool, man. You can't see them clear like I can. Here, I'll be sure. Uh, careful, watch out! Uh, doctor, the next thing I knew, he was, he was over the side and falling to the ice. I didn't think I should move him, so I ran up and got you. Good thinking. Now, give me a hand. We'll get him back on board. My diary entry for that date reads, First Mate Walker confined to sick bay. Weather seems to be getting bad. Ice behind us closing in fast. Crew worried, sullen, almost to the breaking point. Must speak with Captain Craigie about Manson's report on our supplies. Found the captain pacing the deck. Good morning, Doctor. How's Mr. Walker? Oh, condition satisfactory, sir. He had a bad blow on the head when he struck the ice, but fortunately no concussion. Then he should be up and about, uh, back on duty tomorrow. Well, I don't know about tomorrow, sir, but perhaps the next day. And see what you can do to speed his recovery, Doctor. We need him. He's a good man. Yes, sir. Did you uh, see Mr. Manson's report on our supplies? Half a tank full of biscuits, three barrels of salt meat, a limited supply of coffee, beans, and sugar. Ah, then you have read it. I told you, Doctor, that I'm in complete control of my faculties. Yes, sir. 
But then you must surely be aware that those supplies won't last for more than two weeks. And the crew is up in arms. Don't worry about the crew, Doctor. I've called for a meeting with all of them. And I expect you to be there on the main deck at 2 p.m. sharp. All right, lads. All right. All right. Now, listen well to what I have to say. Now, I got you into this fix. And I'm not denying it looks like there may be some hard days ahead. But you shouldn't be better. Just remember how much oil we brought back from other voyages and the money you've put in your pockets. Oh, yes, that's right, Captain. Yeah. We've tried a risk or two before and we succeeded. But if we fail now, there's still no cause for panic. Yonder's the coast of Spitsbergen. And if the worst comes to the worst and the ice closes in behind us, we can make land across it and stay alive until spring. But it won't come to that. Take my word for it. It'll be half rations for everyone for the time being. But keep your heads and hearts. And I promise that you'll pull through and come out rich. The quality of leadership is the most intangible of all character traits. In all history, every leader was able to persuade his followers, whether they were crewmen or people of a whole nation, that they could trust him. All too often, that trust was misplaced. But was it to be so with the captain of the Pole Star? We'll find out in Act Three shortly. Webster's Dictionary defines euphoria as a feeling of well-being or elation, especially one that is groundless or inappropriate to the situation. Some people live in this state all their lives. Others spend their lives in despair. It's really a difficult matter to attain a happy medium, but as for the crew of the Pole Star, they were definitely euphoric. Captain Craigie's speech had an amazing effect upon everyone aboard the Pole Star. Forgotten was the shortage of rations, the ominous increase in the wind, the dropping temperatures, and the ice all around us. Even more startling was the fact that everyone seemed to have put aside their fears about the strange noises and eerie occurrences which had the crew believing the ship to be cursed. And then shortly before noon the following day, Captain Craigie succeeded in amazing me. He was standing at the rail with his sextant, preparing to shoot the sun, when he called out to me... Doctor! Doctor, would you mind joining me? Ah, good morning. How are you today, Captain? In control, Doctor, in control. I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Certainly, sir, certainly. I'll be shooting the sun shortly, and I must be sure when it's exactly noon. Uh, here's the key to my cabin. Would you be so kind as to run down and check your watch with my chronometer and come back and let me know exactly when it'll be high noon? Well, Doctor? Uh, yes, 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 of course. I'll be right back, Captain. I was dumbfounded. No one had ever seen the inside of his cabin, and here I was with the key. I went down, and I must admit, as I opened the door, my heart beat faster. The cabin was a model of neatness. There was one thing that dominated the entire area. A startlingly lifelike portrait of a wondrously beautiful woman. I checked the chronometer, watched always by the brilliant eyes of the woman in the portrait, returned to the deck, and waited till the captain had completed his calculations. Uh, well, Doctor? Uh, your key, sir. Thank you. Did you see her? You... <sighs> You mean the portrait? What else, man? I saw it. What did you think of it? She's a wondrously beautiful woman. Doctor, do you believe that long before something happens to us, we prepare for it, even unconsciously? 
I'm not sure I understand, Captain. No matter. You'll find what I said to be true someday. Well, we still have the whales, Doctor. They're still there waiting for us, whatever else may be in store. With all due respect to your superior knowledge of the Arctic Ocean, Captain, I submit we're never going to get through to the whales. And you don't like the prospect of wintering on the coast of Spitsbergen and living off the land, do you? Oh, it doesn't matter to me, Doctor. But I shall ask another favor from you. Yes, sir? I'd like you to witness my will. In fact, I'd like you to be there when I draw it up. Let's say, tomorrow afternoon. In all honesty, I must say here that my diary shows I was deeply disturbed by the captain's attitude. Certainly my latest conversation with him raised serious doubts as to his sanity. If he were truly mad, then it would be my duty as ship's doctor to have him relieved of his command. While I was wrestling with this dilemma, night fell, bringing with it a numbing terror that drove all else from my mind. I was pacing the deck. The night was at its darkest. And I suddenly heard Manson call... Doctor! Doctor! What? It's... it's bad. Can you not hear it? Tell me that's from the ship. No, Mr. Manson, I shan't. But let's find out together just what it is. It, it, it came from the bow again, I think. Yes, I think so, too. Come on. Hello? Hello? Whoever you are, can, can, we, can we help you? Can you hear me? What, what's the trouble? Doctor, look, there on the ice, moving away from us. See yes. that white ship? Yes, I see it, but I, I think, no, I, I think it's a, it's a polar bear. A polar bear? No polar bear ever made sounds like that. How do you know? It could be wounded or ill. Now look, doesn't, doesn't that walk like a bear? I don't know, but maybe you're right. Where, where are you going? To get a rifle. If it's a bear, I can kill it. It'll certainly help our meat supply. Well, I... I don't see anything now that we're out here on this ice. Do you, Manson? The moon went behind a cloud. Yes. Maybe when it comes out again. But I can tell you now I'm worried about the weather. It looks to be making up for a bone. Well, we won't go too far from the ship. There. There. There, I think I see it. Where? Oh, Over to your right. To your right. About 200 yards ahead. Oh, I got it. You, you better stay back, Doctor. If it's a bear, it can be dangerous. I have the rifle. Right I can see it almost clear now. It's moving slowly. I'll have it in my sight soon. Manson? Manson, is it a... No! Lord in heaven! No! Benson, come on. Come on, you're all right now. Well, what would... Where did I... How did I get back to the ship? I got help. We carried you back. Uh, now, you've had a severe shock. Uh, Just let me inject you and the sedative will give you... It wasn't a bear, Doctor. It wasn't a bear. I saw it clear for just a minute. It was... It wasn't from this world. I swear it was shaped like a woman. But it was smoke or a, or a cloud. It's yes, all right, all right. You'll be getting sleepy now. Just a minute. And we'll talk about it in the morning. It, it was, wasn't a bear. I, I, I saw it. I kept my appointment with Captain Craigie at 2.30. We met in the main cabin and sat at the table on which we ate. The captain had pen and paper, but I wanted to talk with him about things other than his will. Captain, I don't know how else to say this, so I'm going to come right out with it. I think you must get rid of that portrait. We're here to have you witness my last will and testament, Doctor. As I somehow think the subjects are connected. You'll oblige me, Doctor, by keeping your thoughts to yourself. Captain, I was with Manson last night out on the ice. 
And you're not suffering from shock? I didn't get as close to, well, whatever it was that almost drove Manson mad. Are you telling me that there was a presence out on the ice? Well, there was something. I saw it. You too, Doctor. Are you sure you're not suffering from delusions? I'm sure. Well, then it must follow that when you suspected me of having delusions, I wasn't. How did you come by that portrait, Captain? And did you have it commissioned? Was it given to you? I stole it. Oh, you don't mean that. I do. She was mine. Mine. She was married to a dissolute drunk. She loathed him. But she wouldn't leave him. Well, perhaps she didn't love you. Don't ever say that. She loved me and I loved her to distraction. Why do you think she died? It was my fault. I tore her apart, or rather I loved it. The last days all we did was quarrel, but she wouldn't leave her husband. She could not break her marriage vows. And the portrait? I arranged to have it stolen from him. He didn't care one way or the other, but I couldn't sleep thinking of her beautiful face in his house. Since the day it came to me, it's never left me. Nor has she. She's always in my mind, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I mean, Captain. It's an unhealthy situation. Your thoughts about her have... Well, they've brought some strange happenings on this ship, and, and the portrait must go. Ridiculous. Not at all. It's the portrait that nourishes your thoughts night and day, Captain. There'll be no more talk about it. Now, let's get to my will. Very well. But then I ask a favor in return. Which is? That you witness my will. You? You're all right, lad. You have a long life in front of you. But why do you say that? We're shipmates. Your fate and mine. Don't talk nonsense, Doctor. I'm making my will because of you. I'm leaving everything I own to you. But, but why? We, we, we are hardly... Because you've seen her. At last, you've seen her. The captain made his will. And at the last moment, since he had made me his heir, decided to have Walker witness it. That night, sleep would not come. I tossed and turned, but finally gave up and went on deck. At first, I thought I was alone. But then I heard a soft sobbing coming from the other side of the deck. I walked over slowly. Captain? Captain, are you all right? Go in that. There's no place for you here. Captain, you need my help. Now let me... I tell you, go away. Unless you dare to look. Well, if, if you tell me where to look. Out on the ice, lad. Anywhere on the ice. Just keep looking and, and trying and trying. Captain, please, I beg you to come below. I, I see her. There she is. Goodbye, lad, and God bless you. And with that, before I could even move, he was over the side and running off on the ice. I followed him as fast as I could. And as he ran, I could hear him, but always getting fainter and fainter. Coming, my love. Coming, lass. I've waited too long for you. My love. My wonderful girl. Captain. At last. Captain! Captain Craigie, come back! Captain, come back! I'd lost him. Further search on the dark ice was useless. The next morning, Mr. Walker and I set out to trace him. Uh, here. Uh, he fell here. Uh, look, the snow hasn't wiped out all traces. That's right, and he, he got up, but... Which way did he go? Now, let, let's keep straight. Right. There's no reason for him to veer. Or was there, Doctor? Well, don't ask me. I didn't see anything in the dark. That's what he did, eh, Doctor? That's what I thought he did. Well, come on, let's go on. There. There, look straight ahead. Well, come on, man. Oh, no. There's no hurry, Doctor. If that shape is the captain, he's long dead. A man doesn't last long out here lying down. <laughs> 
Yes, the captain right enough. From the looks of him, he's been dead for some hours. Uh, you see that blanket of ice crystals and snow that's covering him? Yes, I see. Oh. He's gone. The wind blew it away. Doctor, did you... I mean, didn't it look like when the wind hit it, it was blown up in the shape of a woman and sort of floated off? Did you notice that, Doctor? Nonsense, Mr. Walker. It was simply a snowdrift. Now let's get the body back aboard ship. Perhaps it was a trick of the eye or mind, but it did appear to have the form of a woman drifting away on the wind. We brought the captain aboard, buried him, and steamed back home with no more disturbances aboard the ship. The portrait? I insisted it be buried with the captain, as it was a provision in his will. May he, or they, rest in peace. Certainly today, the great nations of the world are exploring the possibilities of telekinesis and ESP for their own uses. I, for one, don't think it beyond the realm of possibility that the mind can conjure up images that seem to take on some shadowy form of reality. But then, they're not really ghosts, are they? I'll be back shortly. events are said to cast their shadows before, then the story you've just heard, The Captain of the Pole Star, which was written by Doyle at a very early age, certainly foreshadows Doyle's interest in ghosts and the spirit world. It does even more than that. It shows a deep belief which Sir Arthur held to the end of his life. And I can only believe, if he can hear this, how pleased he must be. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Court Benson, Earl Hammond, and Jane Ives. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time.